ಶಾಂತಿರಂತರಿಕ್ಷಗಂ ಶಾಂತೇರ್ ದ್ಯಶಾಂತೇರ್ ದಿಶಾಂತಿರವಾಂತರ ದಿಶಾಶಾಂತಿರಗ್ನಿಶಾಂತೇರ್ ವಾಯುಶಾಂತಿರಾದಿತ್ಯಶಾಂತೇಶ್ ಚಂದ್ರಮಾಶಾಂತೇರ್ ನಕ್ಷತ್ರ ನಿಶಾಂತಿರಾಪ ಶಾಂತಿರೋಷದಯ ಶಾಂತೇರ್ ವನಸ್ಪತಯ ಶಾಂತೇರ್ ಗೌಶಾಂತಿರಜಾಶಾಂತಿರಶ್ವಶಾಂತಿ ಪುರುಷಾಂತೇರ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಶಾಂತಿರ್ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರೇವ ಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿರ್ ಮೇ ಅಸ್ತು ಶಾಂತಿ may there be peace on earth and in the sky may there be peace in the water and in all directions may there be peace in the plants in the trees and in animals may there be peace in the hearts of all beings may there be peace in everyone and in everything sarve tra sukhina santu sarve santu niramayaha ೇ ಭದ್ರಾ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು ಮಾ ಕಶ್ಚಿತ್ ದುಃಖಭಾಗ್ಭವೇತ್ಸ್ತರತು ದುರ್ಗಾ ಸರ್ವೋ ಭದ್ರಾ ಪಶ್ಯತು ಸರ್ವತ್ಬುಧಿಮಾನೋತು ಸರ್ವತ್ರ ನಂದತು ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಬಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೆಲ್ತಿ ಮೇ ಆಲ್ ಸಿ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗುಡ್ and may no one experience misery may all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies may people everywhere find joy and fulfillment let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in everyone the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
Satoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jotir Gamaya Rutyorma Amrutam Gamaya Aviravir Mahiti Rutrayate Takshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam May the divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. Peace, peace, peace. We begin today with verse number 17. Let's uh, chant together. Yasya nāhaṁ krito bhāvo Buddhir yasya nāvit lipyate Hatva pisa imam lokan Nahanti nanibadhyate He who is free from the notion of I and whose understanding is not trammeled, though he kills these beings, does not really kill, nor is he bound. I mean, in an earlier verse, we have seen that Krishna describes the, the factors that are necessary for any kind of activity to take place. There is the body, the, the, the senses. Um, you see, if you look at the verse number 14, the seat of action, that's the body, the agent, the senses, the various senses, the different and manifold efforts, and the presiding divinity. So there are several factors needed for every activity. And all action occurs in, in the material world. The spirit, the, which is the presiding over everything that happens, itself doesn't do anything. It's a little bit like the... <coughs> The, the highest boss in a company, let's say, doesn't do anything. Uh, all the work that's done is done by the others. And yet, we say, well, who did it? Well, we always point to the boss. It's like, who, who is responsible for the success of Apple, the iPhone, we say, or oh, Steve Jobs? Now, it was not just one person who did it. Probably he, 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 he probably took the final decision. There were so many talents, so many engineers, so many people working behind it. So the actual work is done by the others. But the one at the top is looked upon as the, the primary agent. Although that person doesn't do anything, but that person's presence is necessary in order for whatever it is that happens. The spirit is a little bit like that. The Atman, pure consciousness, that's needed. Without consciousness, no activity is possible. But consciousness itself is not directly involved in any work. So what this verse points out is, he who is free from the notion of I, the Sanskrit word for uh, egoism is ahankara. Aham is I. It is also almost like saying every feeling within me which makes me feel I did it or I have to do it. That's the one that's 
which gives us the sense of I, that is egoism. So he who is free from the notion of egoism, whose understanding is not trammeled, if we are, under, but trammeled is really mean understanding is, is distorted, is, is kind of not free. And what distorts our understanding is our wrong notion of I. If my I is located in a wrong place, my understanding is, is think about it this way. Sometimes it happens when you go to the airport and you are late to receive someone and you hurriedly park your car in a central parking and um, then you rush to the terminal. And after you have received whichever guest you had gone to receive, and then you have to go back to the parking place to find your car, but you have forgotten because you were in such great hurry, you didn't know where you had parked your car. And then you know it can be tough, especially in big airports, uh, finding your car is not easy. So our understanding gets distorted if our if we have parked in a place and do not know anything about it. So if we have, <laughs> it's not a very correct analogy, but you get the point. So what I'm really saying is this, if my sense of I is parked in a wrong place, then my understanding gets distorted. And a wrong place would be, if my sense of I is located in the body, the mind, the ego, then my understanding is distorted. But if my eye is in the right place, in the right place according to Vedanta, according to Gita would be that in the Atman. Now what does it mean that my eye is located in the Atman? It simply means this, wherever my eye is, the characteristics of that thing become my characteristics. For instance now, whenever we say Whenever we feel, I'm young, I'm old, I'm short, I'm tall, I'm fair, or whatever characteristics of the body that we have associated with, or even gender identification, I'm a man, I'm a woman, all of these statements become possible only when my eye is located in the body. Because really, when I say I'm young or I'm old, what we are really referring to is the age of this body. So when the body I refer to as I, that means my I is located here. Similarly, whenever we feel I am happy, I am miserable, I am excited. Now all of these are characteristics of the mind. So although sometimes we say my mind is happy, sometimes we also say I am happy. So my I then is located in the mind. Now, when will my I be located in the Atman? When the characteristics of Atman, I begin to see as my characteristics. And what are the characteristics of the Atman? That is without beginning and without end. So if someone were to ask you what your birthday is, and without having to think about it twice, if you can straight away say, I was never born. That means your eye is located in the Atman. When the fear of death goes away completely, your eye is located in the Atman. Because what is death? Death really means this body in which I seem to be dwelling right now is going to be at some point non-functional. It's going to stop doing whatever it is doing now. And that we say is death. But that's the end of the body. Now, if the end of the body I see as my end, that means my eye is located in a wrong place. But if I know I'm not this, the fear of death will go. The anxiety about aging, the anxiety about illness, and of course the anxiety about death will go. The ups and downs in life that we experience as a result of the ups and downs in 
our physical and mental health will all go. As long as I'm identified with the body and identified with the mind, whatever happens to the body and mind will happen to me. And you can see it very clearly. When in deep sleep, I mean, even before we are enlightened, in deep sleep, <coughs> um, we are not identified with the body or the mind. So, when you are fast asleep, if someone were to come and tell you, you are an idiot, um, not loud enough for you to wake up, um, you will be blissfully in sleep, you won't mind at all. But you would be very affected if someone were to tell you that after you are awake. Um, and so on. So, if I am identified with the body and mind, I react. If I'm not identified, I don't react. Now in deep sleep, that happens naturally. The challenge that Krishna puts before us in the Gita is, if it's, we know it's possible, can I now make it possible in the waking state? That's the challenge. <coughs> so he who is free from the notion of I, and whose understanding is not trammeled, and just explain to you what, a trammeled understanding would mean, though such a person kills these beings, does not really kill, nor is he bound. So if such a person without ego, whose understanding is very clear, goes and kills someone, that killing is not killing. Now, what does this really mean? How can killing be no killing? <coughs> Well, killing is a killing objectively, obviously. But think about it this way. Say if um, a child who is, say, a few months old, maybe a year old, just barely old enough to be crawling on fours, um, maybe sees a tiny butterfly or an ant, and a little baby has no sense of what is life, what is death. And so it's not unusual if, if a little child sees, I'm just saying very young, maybe a year old, or maybe even less, kind of just crushes that tiny little insect. <coughs> Objectively, yes, well, something has been killed, no doubt about it. But think about it from the baby's perspective. As far as the baby is concerned, that killing was not done with the intention to kill or to hurt. There was no sense of, I am going to kill this creature, sense in that little baby. And so the baby doesn't feel guilty about it. The baby is unaffected by it. Well, most of us, after we are old enough, if we become the cause of hurting or killing someone, not only would there be consequences in the external world, even internally, we are going to feel bad about it, or we are going to feel guilty about it, we are going to regret it. Now that sense of regret, that sense of guilt is completely absent in a little baby, because a baby in this instance is free from that sense of ego doing it. <coughs> And a baby therefore won't even be held responsible legally. I mean, there have been cases where little children have picked up a gun and uh, been responsible for, for injury, sometimes even death. Now, they are, not, they are not punished by the court. Well, sometimes their parents or the people in the family are, are admonished for not being careful about keeping firearms in, 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 a, in a safe place. But, but the little baby itself is never held responsible. Now the example I give this is not to say that um, an enlightened being can now just pick up a gun and go and shoot anybody. And yet that, that enlightened being will not feel guilty about it. But the idea is, this is to emphasize that no action, good or bad, 
is going to affect the enlightened being. But the enlightened being, if that be being is really enlightened, would not have reached that state of enlightenment unless and until all the negative impulses are completely removed. So it's impossible for an enlightened being to consciously, willingly go and do something bad. So this statement here that even if an enlightened being goes and kills someone uh, is meant to emphasize that no action will taint the state in which a being who is free from identification with the body and mind uh, will be affected. That's the idea. <coughs> Verse 18. Jnanam Gneyam Parijnata Trividha Karma Chodana Karanam Karma Karteti Trividha Karma Sangraha Knowledge the knowable and the knower form the threefold impulse to action. The instrument, the object, and the agent form the threefold basis of action. It looks, little, looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's pretty obvious that what are the things needed? What are the things that provide the impulse? To any action. And these are the three things. First of all, you need knowledge. You need the knowable, the object of knowledge, and the one who knows. Now, in order for any action to take place, there has to be a person with knowledge wanting to achieve some end. So, the motive that is needed for any action to begin needs has knowledge as its basis. And so knowledge, knowable and the knower form the three important things for any impulse to action. And the action here is <coughs> primarily meant voluntary action. Now karma or action, whenever karma is discussed in the Gita, Almost always, it refers to a voluntary action, not simply any activity, every activity, because every activity is, is an activity. But we know that there are some activities that occur with our conscious knowledge. And there are some activities which are occurring not, not very consciously. For instance, there are lots of stuff happening within our body. The, 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 the pumping of blood, the, 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 the circulation of blood, all the inner activities are going on. It's not like I'm aware of every little thing going on happening within me. But that is karma too. But that activity is not so much a point of discussion in the Gita because that's just happening without my willing it, without my being conscious of it. But every activity I do consciously that needs this knowledge in order for me to even determine whether or not I should do something. So that provides the impulse to action. And the instrument, the senses, the senses of knowledge, the senses of uh, action, the object and the agent. Again, the agent is the one who, agent of action, the ahankara, form the threefold basis of action. So without the sense of agency, no activity is possible. We know that, again, in deep sleep, we cannot do any work in deep sleep because the agency is absent. We don't have the sense of agency that this is the work. We don't have knowledge and we don't have action both. So neither is there any impulse to action nor is there any possibility of action in deep sleep. Now, Krishna is emphasizing these things here because in the subsequent verses then 
he will say that all of these three things, knowledge, action, as well as agency, all of these three things are influenced by the gunas. And there are three different ways. He'll divide all of these three and show what, how does knowledge manifest through sattva, through rajas, through tamas. How does action, what is sattvika action, tamasic action, rajasic action. So this is the kind of a prelude to discussing the threefold um, aspects in which these three manifest. That's in verse number 19. <coughs> Jnanam karma chakar tacha Tridhaiva guna bhe dataha Prochate guna sankhyane Yathavat shrunutan yapi Knowledge, action and agent are declared in the science of the gunas to be of three kinds only. According to the distinction of the gunas, of them also hear duly. So, he will now take up in the subsequent verses all of these three. Jnana, which is knowledge. Karma, which is action. And Karta, which means the agency. The science of the gunas really means there is a school of philosophy called Sankhya, which, which discusses in detail these three gunas. So that's what he's referring to here. So verse number 20. <laughs> Sarva bhute shuye naikam bhavam avyaya mikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu Tadnyanam vithi satvikam. The knowledge by which one sees the one undivided, imperishable substance in all beings which are divided should be known to be satvika. So the world that we encounter now is, is a fractured world, is a divided world. By divided I mean when you look around, when I open my eyes, um, while well, I see things, living things, non-living things. I see people, I see objects, and even objects are of different color, different form, different names. Uh, people, people are different. And again, within, those, within the people itself, we have already so many divisions. We have divided people in the basis of both gender, nationality, culture, race, caste, you name it. There are, there are so many ways. So the world is divided and subdivided and subdivided and subdivided. So that's what we see. Now a sattvika knowledge would be that which seems divided and I look out and I am still able to see everything is somehow not just connected, but all itself one. We see that through poetry, through songs, through art, in many ways this idea um, gets expressed. We like to sometimes think about one global family, like or we are all children of God. So somehow the world is divided, but we find ways to somehow bring it together again. And some of us succeed in bringing everything together better than others. Some of us see the world as connected, some of us see it as, as disconnected. But an enlightened being or the one whose knowledge is sattvika will see that not only is everyone and everything connected, but everyone and everything is really one. Mystics have had that experience. During one of his early visits to Ramakrishna, Vivekananda is a young man named Narendra Nath then. He goes to Ramakrishna's place in Dakshineshwar and Ramakrishna just one touches him. With that touch, 
Vivekananda later described that his mind soared to such heights that he says all the forms began, began to disappear. Everything kind of became one. In the beginning, the forms kind of remained very hazy. But, um, so he said, but that impulse to, to react the way we would have reacted um, went away. He said that when he wanted to cross the street, uh, he could see a car coming, but everything was so one, he didn't feel the need or said, I have to be careful, I might be hit by a car, and so on. Um, he wasn't hit by a car, <laughs> we know that, but, but he was saying how um, a stage can be reached by when everything that seems different no longer seems different. And of course, he was still at least seeing some hazy forms, but there is a stage even higher than that when all forms disappear, all names disappear. So these differences in Sanskrit, the word for these distinctions, differences, is vikalpa. So when the mind gets absorbed in, a, in, in God, sometimes these distinctions might remain a little bit. The distinction of the meditator from the object of meditation. That difference might still remain. Your mind is absorbed fully, but, but not yet become one. So that kind of an experience is sometimes called servikalpa. That is with a difference, with distinction. So there is an absorption, but there are some distinctions do remain. Now some mystics have also experienced a stage by which all distinctions go away. And that is why it is called nirvikalpa. The prefix nir means without. Vikalpa is distinction. So an absorption without distinction. So one who is meditating on the infinite reality, a stage will be reached when the meditator gets so much absorbed into the object of meditation that the distinction between the meditator and the object of meditation completely goes away. Everything becomes one. So when that distinction is totally removed, then that samadhi, that absorption, is considered the highest absorption. It's called nirvikalpa samadhi. So what Krishna is pointing out here is this, that when all distinctions go away, we will be in samadhi. But even intellectually, even before we have experienced it spiritually, intellectually, can we look around us and at least occasionally try to remember, well, everything is really one. It should be easy, even from the perspective of modern science, even if you look at it from physics, let's say, whether it's an object is living or non-living, ultimately, as far as the, the material dimension is concerned, things are really just atoms and molecules. Um, we can find out the chemical composition of every object in this world, living or non-living. We know the chemical composition of the human body. We can know the chemical composition of a table and chair as well. So, Everything is really just nothing but atoms and molecules at the physical level. So even when we see this distinction, a physicist can still say, well, finally, it's just atoms and molecules. And that would be, to some extent, a sattvika knowledge, because you are still then seeing oneness in place of distinctions. Similarly, think about it this way. Whatever is, we are so much affected by whatever is going on within our own minds, just because it is our mind. But think about it this way, that 
just as I experience happiness, joy, sorrow, love, friendship, all these different emotions within my mind, well, there are, everybody has a mind of their own. And there are other people in this world who are also experiencing similar things in their minds. But I am affected positively or negatively only by what's going on within my mind because that's what I'm identified with. But just as I'm able to see at the physical level everything is just atoms and molecules, it's possible to see that every mind, including my own, is, a, is just a small ripple, a small wave into this whole cosmic mind. Look upon all minds of the world put together as like one big ocean of mind. And my little mind is only one wave in it. So if I get identified with only the wave, then I miss the ocean. If I'm able to break out of this confinement within this tiny wave, then this whole ocean is mine. All the joy in the world is my joy. All the suffering in the world is my suffering. So we, our, our self-identity undergoes a radical change when we are able to overcome these distinctions and see oneness everywhere. Even intellectually. Spiritually might take time, but even intellectually, it's, it's very fascinating to see that this is one big ocean of matter, a material ocean, if you like, in which these atoms and molecules are freely flowing. And only when they, ent think about it this way, <laughs> for instance, now, this is one, this is one ocean of matter. And this atoms and molecules presently uh, in which constitute this body, I just see it as me. But someone now brings an apple and gives it to me. Well, right now I see the apple as an object in this world. And then I begin to eat it. If I'm after eating the apple, the atoms and molecules which constituted that apple now have become a part of my body. So now, is the apple an object? Is it something different or it's me? So, actually in Swami Vivekananda in one of his talks, he says, at the quantum level, and I'm not even talking about atoms and molecules, just go even finer things. We are continually exchanging material with this, with this, at the, at, with the universe. Even if you kind of rub your hand against an object, there's continually <laughs> uh, material from the world is entering within me and material from me is leaving out, going out. Um, Swami Vivekananda says that um, some, some particles which may have been in, on Mars or Sun uh, may be perhaps now a part of my body. There's no way for me, you know, because everything is really a material, one big continuous ocean of matter. So just even to think about it, what this does is we realize all these petty distinctions we make, and there's much discussion going on in the times in which we live now about nationality, about our people, about immigrants, about legality and all of that, all of this probably has, has some relevance, but it's so superficial. Because if you see at a much deeper level, there are no boundaries. And it, it really gives us a very different perspective. So try to think about it this way. Think about it even at the ocean of ideas. What, what is my idea when we say, or this is an original idea, let me copyright it, intellectual property. Again, it might have some value uh, at one level, but at a, at a deeper level, uh, 
what does it mean that it's a my idea? If you just think about this one cosmic mind, there are things filled, this whole mind is filled with ideas. I just kind of take something from it and then say it's mine. Uh, but what is mine? So again, the, the, idea, of the, the idea of an int intellectual property is a relatively much, much recent idea. The, in olden days, they never had this idea about this is mine or that's not mine. Mm. Anyway, that's a whole, whole different subject. But, but, um, but the more you begin to think about this, that what does this sattvika knowledge mean? That that which seems different may not be really so different. That we can make a conscious effort to see everything as one, our life will change. The way we see things, the way we do things will undergo radical change. So that is what um, sattvika knowledge is. The knowledge by which one sees the one undivided, imperishable substance in all beings which are divided should be known to be sattvika. We'll stop here today and subsequent verses then we'll also discuss uh, knowledge which is tamasic and knowledge which is uh, rajasic and so on. Do so you have any comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah. Namaste, Swamiji. Thank you for the great lecture. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, so one question is, um, from before our month-long break, there was one, I guess, mantra, which you said at the beginning of our lectures, which is, and you should correct me if I say it incorrectly, but, um, maheti. Can you explain what that means? Uh, I, I think what we'll do, let's uh, first uh, limit our discussion okay, to sure. this, what we have studied now. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the second question is that, um, one. so you were talking about poetry and so on and so forth, and one of the things that we, so we, you were talking about how sometimes we see the world in terms of all of these distinctions. But one quotation I saw once by Gertrude Stein, who was some sort of philosopher, um, you could read more about her on Wikipedia or something, but uh, she said, um, her quote is, I think I wrote it down, but I think it's sometimes there is using everything. So in a very basic sense, it could be sometimes just trying to live and use all the parts of your body and try to, I, I guess the best, one example would be like when you're playing sports, right? Sometimes you feel like, okay, I'm using all the parts of my body. And sometimes just something as basic as that in my understanding would be good. Because in some basic sense, some distinctions are going away when you do that activity. Do you have any sort of comment on that? Mm, no, no, actually I didn't quite understand what you were saying. Just think about it, yeah. put it in a little concise way. In the meantime, we can take some other questions. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, so, so Amjin, the way that we can divide the material world at the smallest unit, we can call it an atom, is there any way to break down the spirit into a small unit? Um, actually, no. Um, we can, but, but that won't be, we won't be able to do it. Now, thing is this, in order for only that which is perishable can be broken up into parts. Because oftentimes, composition really means parts coming together, and decomposition means the parts which are together have separated. Since the spirit is partless, doesn't have any part. Because if the spirit could have parts, then the spirit could die. Because the spirit could decompose into these constituents. And therefore you cannot really uh, break down spirit into parts. Really you can't do it. Apparently we're kind of already doing it. When we say, like, my Atman, 
and we kind of think just as I have a body and I have a mind and everyone has a body and everyone has a mind, everyone has an at Atman inside. So we kind of have already divided the spirit into at least as many living beings there are. But that division is really not real. That's only, that's, that's another part of an, uh, a wrong understanding. But we still think of it that way. Yeah. yeah. Swamiji, for the three um, types of um, consciousness, uh, nirvikalpa, samadhi, and the other two, um, are they sequential stages in the evolution of one's meditation or can it happen in any order? I would think they could happen in any order. I don't think it's so difficult to provide a blueprint of spiritual progress because there is no one one road map. There are really infinite possibilities. Having said that, the the logical way to think would be, since we are already dealing with forms and distinctions, a first experience could be an absorption with distinctions, since we already are dealing with distinction. And then a higher thing would be, then all distinctions go away. That might seem to be a very logical thing to do. But we are also dealing with domain which is beyond logic. <laughs> so it could be either way. Yeah. And then you also mentioned that one can have an intellectual understanding before a spiritual understanding. Yes. Um, again, it's not an absolute must. Um, I mean, that one of the big questions is how important is intellectual understanding for spiritual enlightenment? I don't think it's possible to say that it's absolutely necessary. Because we know of many enlightened beings, great saints, great um, souls, who are not scholars, many of them who didn't study any scriptures. So to say that that's absolutely needed would, would just contradict what we have seen. On the other hand, it cannot be denied that uh, studying books, studying texts, trying to understand things intellectually, does, absolutely, it's true, that does help remove many of our doubts, it answers many of our questions, and certainly does help in one's spiritual life. So, it's helpful, but it's not absolutely necessary. Yeah. So, so in other words, can, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, can one fake it till one makes it? Can, can you one? fake it till you make it? <laughs> Let's say that? Can you fake it till you make it? Uh, so explain a little bit. So let's say I have an intellectual understanding of everything is one. Can I? But I don't have a like a deep spiritual understanding of mm -hmm. direct experience of that mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Could I go about living my life just assuming that's true and living like that without? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So you can't fake it till you make. It. No, I don't, I wouldn't call it faking it. <laughs> what I what I would say is that. making an effort to see reality as it is might lead us to a state when we will be able to do the same thing effortlessly. So you're not really, it's a little bit like actually something similar happened in one a, a monastery in San Francisco so we had a monk there, this happened sometime way back in the 50s. So he had just joined the monastery, a novice, uh, he was doing his uh, meditation and all the practices. And after about five years in the monastery, he just felt, you know, he had made some progress, but nowhere near the extent of progress he thought he would. And he was like, how much more time it's going to take for me to be enlightened. Already five years I'm here. 
how much more time? And so he goes to the Swami who was in charge there. His name was Swami Ashokananda, a great, great, great Swami of our order. And so he asked him, what more do I need to do in order to become enlightened? And the Swami looked at him and said, what are you waiting for? Try to live now, try to do now what you would do when you became enlightened. You see, so try to live now as if you are already enlightened. Now, think about it this way. For an enlightened being to live like an enlightened being is easy. But for an unenlightened person to live like an enlightened being is difficult. Now, you're not really, if you're, if you're unenlightened and then you go on pretending, telling people you are enlightened, then you are faking it. So you're not, you're not trying to appear other than who you are. You know deep down you're not enlightened, but you know what the ideal is. And so you say, let me now try to make an effort to look, to look at myself and look at the world the way an enlightened being would do it. Now, because you're not enlightened, you're not going to succeed fully. You're going to fail miserably in the beginning. But you still keep on trying. Now, we know through any, anything that we do in life, in the beginning, um, it, in the beginning, is it okay now? Yes. Okay. In the beginning, things are always very difficult. You're trying to learn a new mus musical instrument. And uh, you know some of the best musicians, how effortlessly they play. And you become inspired by that. And then you say, let me also try to do it this way. Now in the beginning, um, you will not succeed. You, you, you know, you, you press the wrong keys, you have to be very conscious. You have a lot of effort is needed. But you keep on practicing, being um, not discouraged by your failures. And then slowly, 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 you begin to acquire greater mastery over it. And a stage will be reached when you will be able to play it as effortlessly, as beautifully, as a great position, exactly the same thing will happen. So intellectually you understand what, if you understand intellectually, how an enlightened being will, enlightened being sees oneself and the world, and then and it's pretty simple then. Waking up in the morning, tomorrow, I say, I'm going to make a conscious effort to look at myself and the world the way an enlightened being would do. And maybe you forget after one minute. One minute is also too long, I think. <laughs> maybe 30 seconds. But, but the thing is this, if you can maintain that awareness, even for 30 seconds, even for 30 seconds you can look upon yourself as, I'm not this body, I'm not the mind, I'm the spirit. And all of this is really this infinite spirit appearing, just a a play of names and forms around me, but it's really this one infinite spirit. If you can maintain that awareness for 10 seconds, let's say, well, for those 10 seconds, you've kind of become a, a part-time enlightened. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I'm, not, I'm, I'm very serious. But e even 10 seconds is a, la is a fairly good thing. But if you can do it for 10 seconds, there is hope. If I can do it for 10 seconds today, maybe tomorrow, I'll do it for 15. Maybe after six months, I might be able to do it for half a minute. And all that I have to do then is just increase this thing. And a time will come, and I can do it 24-7. And if you can do it 24-7, by the which time, really, it's become so much a part of your, part of who you are that no longer any effort is needed, then even before you knew it, you're already enlightened. How does that sound? So it's not faking it. It's not faking it. It would be faking if you try to pretend other than who you are. 
So long as you don't make any of those kind of pretensions, you're okay. That should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, Amiji, I have a very practical question. Um, oh, in oh, come on. Others are also practical before <laughs> you. <laughs> it's just been bothering me for a long time, and not for a long time, po post-elections time, let's put it like that. And for all the years that I've been practicing to erase this division, um, all the divisions that I could possibly have, and identifications of myself and others, etc. But right now I have very hard time, and... I feel like, you know, I strongly identify myself as a woman, as a scientist that believes in the climate change, as an immigrant and many more that, you know, people are getting, like, being imposed. And I just, I'm very rajasic and I can't, like, balance my gunas really well. It's either tamas or rajas. And there's, like, little sattva when I'm started to get involved um, in all of what's going on. And I was just wondering whether you have any suggestions on uh, how to still be involved, because I feel like if you are trying to um, not being involved, it's ignorance, it's um, avidya, um, because sort of you have to be aware of what's around you. Um, or is there a golden middle of what to do? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think, I, I think it's, I don't think it's always so much a matter of choice. It's not like, oh, if I want, I really want to think I'm the Atman, but right now I have to be aware of all these other things. It doesn't happen that way. The thing is this, um, our past impressions of the mind, the samskaras, will impel us in a certain direction. Whether it's activism, whether it's my identity uh, based on my gender or the or the things that I'm interested in, the things which matter to me, you know, climate change, justice. Now, these are all important things. Now, it's possible to hold on to them, and it's possible also to hold on to the idea of spirit. The only thing is you can't do them both at the same time. That's what's going on. <laughs> yes. What you can do is, during the times when you have your, say, time of prayer or meditation, if you can train your mind that at the time of meditation, I'm not going to think about all these hundred other things I'm interested in. At the time when I'm doing my spiritual practice, I'm going to think of the spirit, nothing else. That is actually the training of the mind, that I can hold my mind to decide at this time my mind will remain on this subject. And then of course, then you go to work, you're doing a science or whatever you're doing at this time. So when you're in a laboratory, you say, I'm now, I'm going to put my mind here and do the best I can. So that's first the training of the mind. Secondly, because the Atman or the spirit is the source of all knowledge, all perfection, all power that we have. The more you are able to keep your mind on the spirit, even if it's for a few minutes in the morning or evening, whenever you are meditating, that effect will remain and somehow energize and and, and make you look at these other issues, which may not be so transcendent, in, with, in, with a different way than other people. So there are, there are people who are interested in climate change, and there are people who are interested in justice. But m what I'm saying is, if you also have this spiritual inclination, then with that understanding, not just intellectual understanding, but a little bit of practice with spirit. When you again take a look at these issues of climate change and justice, the way you will respond to them and what you would do there 
would be a, at least a little bit different from others who came at those same things without that background. And then, and then it's really up to you to prioritize of like what is, what is more important to me. And then depending on how you set your priorities, your life will go in that direction. So maybe reading Gita instead of the news. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that's a choice. I think, I think we should stop here. Uh, Ram, we will decide your, uh, discuss it next time, okay? Sure. Uh, so we'll, we'll stop here and then when we meet uh, next week, we'll continue this discussion. Om Chananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhu This Sunday, we'll have um, Antar Yoga, and as we do every time, um, we'll have uh, readings by two of our members. There'll be music, um, there'll be a reflection, and then we'll have a soup and also a birthday celebration of everyone born in the month of February. Anyone here born in the month of February? There you go. So, Please come on Sunday, and then if any of your friends or members of your family are born in February, bring them along. So that's on Sunday. Next Wednesday, we'll continue the study of the Gita, and on Tuesday and Saturday, our meditations will also continue as usual. Let's conclude with a prayer on page 3. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto you.